I'm here today with Mark Garrett Hayes, who is a sales enablement expert, accredited coach, and a certified trainer who helps sales leaders and managers learn how to coach their salespeople and dramatically boost performance and revenue. Working both in-house and remotely with sales teams internationally, Mark's developed powerful tools to help sales leaders to get the very best from their teams. He's helped leaders reduce A-player churn, drive greater accountability amongst their reps, and revolutionize how they get the best from their salespeople. He's the host of the popular weekly Sales Coach podcast, where he interviews sales leaders and thought leaders at uh, SaaS and tech companies worldwide each week. And he's the author of Sales Coaching Essentials, How to Transform Your Sales Team, which has just been published. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you so much, Alison. Yeah, I'm still looking at this. Can we see it? uh, Yes, we can. Um, Still, there we go. Gorgeous, isn't it? It is. Yes, I'm very proud of it. It is. It's a strange feeling having something uh, physical. It's no longer in your mind. It's actually manifested before your eyes. It's my hand. I'm quite proud of how it feels and how it looks. And occasionally I wake up and turn on the light and go, oh my goodness, that's my book. Look at my uh, book. Look at my book. It's yeah. still there. I didn't dream it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. Well, I want to talk to you about the book, obviously, because we, yeah. you know, we always do on this podcast. But I also want to talk to you about sales coaching, because I mm. hadn't really understood the difference before I you know, read your manuscript. That difference between training and coaching and, mm. and why training just isn't enough. Just, just tell us a little bit about what it does for sales teams. Yeah, um, I think that the the amount of money spent annually by companies on sales te- sales training or sales enablement, to give it its current name, is huge. Uh, literally, it's it's in the billions. And I I call this the sales training graveyard. It's where training goes to die. Uh, we can invest in people's knowledge, but that does not necessarily mean that they will use that knowledge or help be held accountable for the application of that knowledge. And it comes at a huge cost to organizations. So the way I explain this is that training is information, but coaching is transformation. Coaching allows you to align someone's what to do with how to do. And coaches are people who don't jump into the trenches and fix things for people, but they let go to grow and encourage people to think about how to address their own challenges and solve them. And so coaching enables this through conversation, helping people to understand what the issue is or challenge facing them, uh, what they should do or can do to address this and to get them to take action to solve that problem. So in in summary, training just gives people um, information, but, but what coaching does is it helps you as a company as a leader to ensure that people are using it. They're putting into practice what you know they know so we generate return on investment. And I want to come back to the conversation piece because you use that really mm. interestingly in the book as well. But just mm. more generally, I'm guessing mm. coaching doesn't come naturally to all managers. I know it does to some, and I can no. think of some managers I've had who are just natural coaches, yeah. but it's not an easy thing to do, is it? It's sort of you feel like you should be the one with the answers. Well, that's it. And, and often people think, well, I'm the manager. I'm the the person with the badge. I should be deciding how things go and what's done and by whom. The thing is, if we're always in that directing mode, we're we're short-circuiting the innate resourcefulness that our people have, and we're not doing them a service. We need to trust people, hire people who are coachable, people who are willing to come up with their own answers and, and solve things. If we're all the time trying to fix things, we're neglecting our own role, and we're um, I, I just I think we're not tapping into the potential that people have to surprise us and themselves, and and that's why I think coaching is is the way forward. It it is as many salespeople tell me something that's core to their competencies. We all know that we should be coaching more, but often we're not coaching because we're intent on fixing things and doing things our way, and that's a problem. And of course, you can't be there over your sales rep's shoulder every call. No. You need to, at some point to give them the resources and the confidence that they can make the call when they when the situation right. arises. Yeah. yeah. It's got to be a safe space in your team to try things out, to stuff up and, and get back up. So it, selling is not about uh, best outcome every time. It's about best effort every time. Mm-hmm. So we need to encourage people to feel that under your leadership, it's okay to, to, to try things, experiment and learn from what you do and then improve what you do. But if I'm all the time as a manager, micromanaging, I'm taking my off the ball of what I should be doing and I'm um, not tapping into what you could be doing. 
And coming back to that idea of conversation, which of course is mm-hmm. the heart of, of coaching, mm-hmm. when you came to write the book, to just talk us through the process that you went through, you know, how am I going to communicate this to somebody reading the book? Because I'm not in the room with them. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I agonized um, when I first had that conversation with you back in 2020, sitting in my car, I kind of took my courage in my hands and I made this phone call and I thought, I don't believe this. I'm I'm contacting a publishing company to position myself as an author. Um I really didn't know what to write. I felt I had to write something. It was COVID. It's time to produce something. Um, The world has changed. I I should have something to show for this uh, period of my life. And um, I initially began to write just in a scattered approach, almost like blog posts. And hopefully, I hope things would glue themselves together. Then I realized that's not working. In fact, I became hypercritical of the language. And I thought, am I writing a novel here? Am I writing a magazine article? So I had to think about the structure. And and this is the thing I learned. One of the things I learned is that you have to build it before you write it. If you dive into the words, you become a wordsmith and you start worrying about grammar and syntax and you you beat yourself up about what it sounds like. But it's not about what it sounds like to you. It's about the impact it has on other people. So the process was one of absolute agony, long, long walks by the Shannon here in Ireland, thinking, I'm not going to finish this. There's no way this will happen. And gradually, somehow, um, I just realized it's about serving the audience. Who, who, who am I serving? Who are they? What's it like to be in their shoes? Question one. Question two, what do they need help with? Which key things, which key problems do they need help with? And three, what do I want them to do? And why should they work with me? And once I got those answers right, it began to come together. And you use conversation quite a lot to to kind of communicate that as well, which now you've sort of said that, I have a much clearer sense of, of how that was working in your head. You're literally imagining that person sort of in front of you and you're showing them how it could go with one of their employees. But there's a lot of relationships to manage there to capture on the page. There so, are. No, do go on. One thing which helped me was to use the podcast more and the guests whom I had on the show were the kinds of people whose stories, whose language then could actually form part of the book. And I realized when I looked at transcripts, and this, by the way, is a great reason to have a podcast, is it provides you with a bank of content that you can insert into the book. Because we want that healthy balance, I think, of not just what you say, but what other people say about what you say. And I found that when I could use other people's stories in the book, this gave it some uh, context. So, yeah, I found interviewing people was was a good thing to do, and I it, I, it shaped my view of what should be in the book and and how reading the book would solve that problem for them or those problems for them, and also capturing the language the way they describe those problems yes. helps me to sound like I'm in their head. Yeah, and I couldn't agree with you more about the the podcast thing. It's, it just there's the content generation and getting people's perspectives. Mm. There's also something about the energy of it, isn't it? When you're sitting writing, it's it's quite draining. <laughs> there isn't any input going in from anybody yes. else. And then you bring it to the podcast and suddenly you're kind of re-energized and you see new things. And it, it feels, it's a lovely interplay, I think, between the two different kinds of energy. It's true. You want your voice, but their voice. And often their voice lends to your voice and vice versa. And because it's your book, you can um, chop that up in different ways. You can use a quotation from someone. You can use someone's description of an issue they're having. And that gives you a whole bank of knowledge. I think in in total, I would have had enough to write another 200 pages. Thankfully, I didn't. But I was able (laughs) to chop it down. But but having that, that bank of knowledge of other people's perspective really added some context and the thing is, when I came to ask those people for endorsements, there was this element of reciprocity. And that was really important because I asked a bunch of people, would you like to contribute an answer to this thing for the book? They were net new people, people who didn't know me, really. They were in my network. Not one of those people provided an answer. But having, if you will, given time to someone on my show, those people felt like they owed me something. And everyone except one person except one dr- drama person who I'll not go into, who was just seemed, seemed to think it was a cheeky thing to ask. Everyone else um, 
couldn't do enough. Literally said, no problem. What would you like me to write? Um, what would you like me to mention? And that filled the first two pages of my book. And that's that social proof, having other people's voices, names, um, titles in the inside cover of the book. It, it really sets the tone for um, its, its credibility. And uh, yeah. again, it's funny how that came to, I never planned it this way, Alison, but just having that podcast, having that bank of other people's input gave me ideas, one, about what to write, two, how they see those problems, and three, when the time came to ask for something, they were primed to reciprocate. So that's three great reasons to start a podcast, none of which were in your mind when you did. So why, why did you start your podcast and what else has it done for you? It's it's helped me to clarify my thoughts. It's also added some self discipline, and that's something that uh, is not my strongest point. And and it's funny how coaches need coaches. Often, many people who need to be coached actually start off as coaches because we're trying to help, and in helping, we're helping ourselves. The podcast gave me permission to put my voice out there. It also, when the time came, opened doors because I could say to someone, "I'm a podcaster like you," and it's it's like a rung on a ladder. You are no one until you are someone. And that's a bit harsh, but when someone realizes you have an opinion, you have a voice, um, that's an act of courage. Many people will never start podcasts. Even fewer will write books. So if you think of it like a, like a pyramid, the ground floor is writing things, uh, at least some kind of um, maybe a video you make or a, a blog post. Um, step two is having a consistent output of those thoughts in the form of a channel on YouTube, for example, like um, your your channel, or having some kind of uh, podcast. And once I had the podcast and I could align what someone needed from being a guest on that show with what I needed, then synergy happened. And I had no problem, well, a few problems with getting guests on the show. Sometimes people would you know, prevaricate and, and reschedule. But just having a podcast actually sets you apart from competition. And having a book now has really began, began to uh, uh, change how I think about my business and my brand. And, and having that book has actually encouraged people to contact me proactively. So often with a podcast, you're acting, um, you're acting as a conduit for other people's um, view of the world, and they're happy to share it with your listenership. It's in their interest, too. Having the book now has changed that, I think, that that uh, traffic stream. Now people are coming to me. The fact that I'm an author, and I can actually say that out loud, it's actually strange still to hear it in my head, <laughs> um, it, it's it's actually creating some ripples. It People are now saying to me, would you like to be on this? Could you write this? It, it's just amazing. It's actually less work now. Once that book's done, I'm surprised. I'm truly surprised about the ripple effect it's having and how people are now coming to me. Uh, without me having to chase them. I love that. That's, I mean, it's great to hear, for, obviously, from a business perspective, because that's what we want for our um, for our authors. But I love that yeah. taxonomy that you set out there as well. That you're kind of you, the undifferentiated mass of people are consumers, in a sense, and and then you become a curator by by setting yeah. up that kind of the, the, the platform for for having other people on, and then the book takes you into that creator space, doesn't it? And 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 really, yeah, it's a yeah, really like interesting taxonomy. Yeah. Um, yeah, brilliant. Really interesting. I want to talk about the writing as well, Mark, because apart from walking by the Shannon, which I think yeah. actually sounds great, I think I'd like to do more of that in my writing technique. Um, but <laughs> what did it look like for you? When did you work best? And what surprised you about the process? And what did you learn about yourself? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think back to the, um, it's understanding how the human brain works. There are times when you listening to this will be creative it just comes to you in a rush, bang, 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 you get this out. And then there's the dry patch of maybe, in my case, six months, and it's, oh no. Uh, and it's a feeling of depression and just this inner dialogue is, 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 is turmoil. And I realized that I can't always force that creativity. Um, it, it does make sense sometimes to walk away. So it's about having your expectations clear in your mind. And what I've learned is it's it's good to go in stages. One, you should start by just dumping ideas onto some piece of paper. I got some from Tesco's, which is in 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 this part of the world. If you're listening to this in the states, you might have staples. 
Um, it's a giant, you know, it's a store that sells stationery. I got this huge roll of brown paper and I stuck everything on it, mind mapping, just dumped ideas down, walked away, came back uh, maybe um, a few hours later or a day, and I began to see connections between things. And then I used index cards and sticky notes. So that that took a while. And I often showed, I show that a couple of times to people and said, what do you think is missing here? <clears throat> Sorry, what do you think is connecting here? And people could see connections that I couldn't. So I've learned that the next book I'm writing, yes, I'm writing another book. I'm going to, I've decided to, um, is to, to build it before I write it. The structure is key. Once you've got the structure right, um, once you've got the shell right, you can begin to think about the furniture. The temptation often is if we short circuit that process, we try and force ourselves to be that wordsmith I mentioned, and we dive into the language and this and all that stuff that doesn't really matter until the whole thing is built. So I've learned that you have to involve people in that creation of that structure as soon as possible, get feedback from them, um, reflect on whom you're serving, think of their inner voice, the language they use, and then allow that allow your brain to scattergun that approach until you see connections and then build that structure take a break maybe for a week or two come back and then begin to build uh, content into that and something else i write wrote or, or learned allison is is the act of telegrams don't try and write full sentences write telegrams yeah that's a great way of putting it go yeah. on so incomplete sentences so you might say uh, managers must listen more than talking now, when I come to write that, it'll be different. It'll sound like a sentence with definite articles and of punctuation, etc. But when I give myself permission to write telegrams, I don't have to worry about how that really sounds because I know it won't actually sound like that when it's out there. But it's beginning to form kind of proto-sentences, if you will. I'm not worried about perfection. This is just uh, invention. So when I've got those telegrams down, um, that's a paragraph done. To two or three telegrams, that's a paragraph. And then the brain goes to work and begins to fill in the rest. So it's funny how we want to finish the thing, but the brain doesn't work that way. It needs structure and then it goes to work thanks to the neural pathways in the mind and begins to join things together. And if we try and rush that process, it's frustrating. And I found that's, um, I have to be more patient, not too patient, otherwise you miss deadlines. <laughs> But um, when you are uh, patient with your mind, how it works, um, that creative process uh, actually serves you. And I, and I realize now that there are parts where I'm slow, really slow, and there are parts where I'm quicker than I thought I would be. So it's now about finding that compromise. Mm -hmm. So when I'm working with you in the next book, I'm not being chased and I'm not too quick on some things. So it's, it's, it's a learning exercise. And the way I write something is not the way other authors listening to this today might write. Um, it's very personal, actually. It is, but you, it's a great system and you've set it out really clearly. So thank you. I, th I, I, love, I love the idea of telegrams as well. It's kind of halfway between a subheading and a bullet point, isn't it? It's like yeah. the, the key point here, just and then get the whole thing down. How, for you, to use the language of project management, was that a kind of waterfall? So you, you started off and then you wrote it, or was it agile? Did you kind of go back and revisit the structure? Great point. Uh, and for people listening, waterfall is classic project management methodology. The idea being that we know everything. We have an idea of the money, the resources, the time up front. But as we know from infrastructure projects, it doesn't work that way. Agile is reality. So it was actually, in my mind, I thought I was a, a waterfall project manager. Absolutely not. It was all these stops and starts and and go backwards and then go forwards again. And I think that's a great point, Alison. It's it's that reality is that sometimes you go two steps forward, one step backwards, and then sideways for a bit, and then back on track again. If we think that it will be linear, uh, we're fooling ourselves. I'm sure there are yeah. people out there listening to this who are wonderful, and they they can get this uh, like changing gears and go clickety clickety click. For me, it wasn't. It was lots of that funny noise when you put the gar gear into the wrong uh, place in the car. <laughs> <laughs> grinding, yes. <laughs> grinding and, and panic and then backwards and then start the engine again. Yeah. I remember coming back home after a writing day and my husband asked, you know, how many words I'd, I got. I actually had net negative. <laughs> he was just like, wow, that's that's terrible. I said, no, 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 it's fine because those had to come out and, you know, the, the job. Yeah. But if you are measuring it by a really simplistic number of words on the page at the end of the day, you know, added to the page, 
it doesn't always work and that's okay <laughs> oh it's okay yeah be kind to yourself and i said yeah. that in the book um when i'm tr i'm trying to talk to a, so a colleague of mine murray said to me i like what you've done because you've made the reader the hero so yeah. i use lots of you in the book i'm trying to speak to someone as if i'm in their head and i think that's very important in a non-fiction book because the reason someone buys a non-fiction book is to typically solve a problem it could be leadership it could be resilience health mindset um you know something like that so it, it really is important to me that the person can jump into a part of the book and feel like i'm talking to them mm -hmm. addressing the actually, problem in their language yeah you do that really well and very conversationally and very authentically and um, it's interesting because in with other people i have found them writing to you plural we you say you know some of you may have found and it so destroys that illusion that the author is talking to you as an individual. So it's a, it's a great point to make. Yeah. I'm going to ask you for your best tip, Mark. If I had to say, okay. you know, you had one thing that you were going to say to somebody who's uh, at the beginning of this process, what would you ask them to hang on to? I would say that you have to, I think I mentioned this, build it before you write it. You, you have mm -hmm. to focus on the structure don't start writing too early. Uh, you have to share the outline, get feedback, involve other people because there are payoffs to that. You will find out things. I interviewed, for example, one guy who was, um, his name's David. At, at the time, he was the director of inside sales for British Airways. And I remember sitting at Dublin Airport in the car in the baking sun for two hours on the iPad interviewing this guy. And I, it just blew my mind how he, how he described things. And I thought that's a lesson for the next time is to involve other people, interview them as if they're in the book. You don't have to include what they're writing, what they're saying, but listening to the voice of your reader, capturing that, it will have an amazing impact on how you think and how you're going to communicate with them when they have that book in their lap. It will sound like you're in their head speaking to them about the problems they recognize and why, they're, why they need to be solved by someone like you. Yeah, it's a great tip. And again, we're back to that conversation piece, aren't we? Actually, one thing I did want to ask you about conversation was yeah. one of the distinctive things about the book is the way that you put in almost sample conversations. I don't know, I can't remember the exact phrase you used, but it's that sort of sense yeah. of, you know, this is how the dialogue might play out. This is how it might play out differently. Where did that come from? And how did you sort of find those to be so realistic? I Two things. One, I found that idea from a different book. And I thought, isn't that an interesting idea to put this into context? It also helps to show that you know what you're talking about. This isn't just a bunch of notes you've, you've you know, cudgeled together. This is helping someone see that you can actually put this into practice. And in, t in terms of your second question, where did that come from? It was from notes I had from previous conversations. I would record using, let's say, Zoom, and the Otter app, otter.ai, which plugs nicely into Zoom and actually creates a transcript. So when I'm coaching, I would obviously anonymize names, companies, all that kind of thing. But I would look at the language and that helped me to influence or to shape how I uh, created model conversations for particular challenges that sales leaders would create. And it really helped. And I'd, I'd use this phrases I would never use myself, but that's the point. It's the voice of the reader, not necessarily my voice. That's brilliant. And I think answers a question that a lot of people ask me, which is about how you use real examples and whether you anonymize and you kind of, you, you draw on them, but you abstract out of them to something that's going to be more helpful for the reader. It doesn't have to have every detail of that conversation and it shouldn't because that's not helpful, but it is about basing it on that observed reality and then yeah. packaging it in a way that makes it most maximally useful for the reader. That's a great, great um, demonstration of it. And I always ask people to recommend a book. You're not allowed to recommend Sales Coaching Essentials, obviously. I will do that for you in the intro, don't worry. Um, but if you said to um, somebody, you know, what, what book has been really, really helpful for you as a reader? Yes, uh, without question. Well, two books, but I'll mention one. I can mention two if you like, but the first book Go is on. Influence, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. Robert Cialdini. Why? Robert Cialdini. Uh, the anniversary edition came out recently in the last two years or so. This book alone will help you to understand from a business perspective how people do things and why they do things. So all of these uh, 
elements of his six principles of persuasion are actually applicable to the act of writing a nonfiction book. Uh, social proof, showing how other people like Mike Weinberg, uh, who was one of the top selling authors, gave me um, an endorsement, and that's on the cover of my book. The number of people who on LinkedIn said, I'm buying the book because Mike Weinberg has endorsed this, that's huge. And then inside the book, all the VPs and CEOs who gave me that endorsement too. That's social proof. That's Cialdini's idea. Uh, the second thing is, is scarcity. If, you're, if you want people, for example, to, um, let's say, sign you up as, as a solution provider, as a consultant for them, if that's the intention of your book, providing that uh, commercial offering, then an element of scarcity shows how working with you will help them, but it, it's linked to taking action. They have to take action, sign up for something, subscribe to something, otherwise they don't get that thing. So lead magnets could could come from the book, offering people something in connection with a time-bound offer. I won't go through all of these, but there's so many things We've out there. We've already touched on reciprocity, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, we have, exactly. Yeah. So the act of having someone on the podcast meant that someone felt they owed me something, and it did. When I came to ask them for something, they gladly gave. But because I'd given first, um, that really helped me to ask them for mm -hmm. a reason that they couldn't say no to. And they didn't do it that way. That sounds manipulative. But when I came to ask for favors, because I had that bank of goodwill, people said, yeah. no problem, Mark. We, they knew me and they trusted me and that was important. So I'll not go through all of those, but that's a really important book, The Psychology yeah, of Persuasion. Book. Why would someone help you do something for you? How can you serve people in a way that makes them feel they want to trust you, endorse you, um, talk to you, and eventually, hopefully, buy from you. Mm. And your second book? My second book probably would be something like um, The Chimp Paradox from Professor Steve Peters. Steve Peters. I've mentioned this so many times on, on coaching sessions with sales leaders. Um, how people's brains work, that, that fear factor. And I think as an author listening to this or a prospective author, where does this voice of fear come from? If, if you can't overcome it, you will perhaps not write a book. And it's important that you manage that inner dialogue, recognize why that voice of doubt's in your head. It's okay. It's okay. But learning how to manage that and not have it overtake you, because if it does, you'll just struggle and then give up. And Although they say everyone has a book in them, uh, not everyone actually writes a book, right? So it's not about having the best book in the world. It's about having a book out there in the world with your name on it. And to do that, you have to really dig deep and overcome that voice of objection or rejection or fear of rejection and know where it comes from. And that book really helped me. The, the Chen Paradox, all about the amygdala, the part of the brain that tends to sabotage us, and then how to use logic, the rational mind, to play down that that negative talk and and to get things done yeah it, it's such a good book and i totally agree that uh, that writing a book is a great demonstration of things that really awaken the chimp <laughs> and yeah. even just being aware of that being knowing that it's happening and knowing that it's it's not true it's just something that happens in your brain it's is hugely helpful that's brilliant thank you so much mark if people want to find out more about you more about the sales coaching stuff you do the podcast the book where should they go well, the book is on Amazon and uh, many fine bookstores. Um, anywhere you buy your books. Anywhere you buy your books, right. It's also um, over on your website. And um, it's, uh, I would say people can connect with me on LinkedIn. That's usually the easiest place if, they're, if they want to connect and, and chat. I'm very happy to share some of my um, experiences, good and bad, from writing the book. If anyone wants to drop me a line, you know, happy to do that for your listeners. And the other place is salescoacher.com. That's my shop window. It's going through a, a process now of redesign. And the final thought I would share is that um, I wish I'd lined things up better. I wish I'd lined the book up with the revamp of the brand and, and other things like that. So this is another good reason to project manage this. It's not about writing the book. It's about having the book serve you and using it in a way that actually adds to your business. How does this fit into my business message? How does this fit into my brand um, as part of my business model? It's not just a, a sheaf of paper. It, it's got a job to do. And I now see this book has got to get into the right hands. And that's the, the next part. It's about marketing. The book is great, wonderful, but now market it. That's got yeah. to be done. Otherwise, it's, it's, all, you know, it's, uh, it's not being used properly. Yeah. This is phase two. Yeah. There are yes, lots of moving parts. Yeah. 
Unbelievable. <laughs> huge, huge <laughs> learning curve, Alison. Huge. Think of Eddie the it's Eagle. Not a that, that jump. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've got those big glasses trivial. on right now. It's not, <laughs> no, it's worth it though. It's worth it. Yeah, it really I've is. Just got this image of you as Eddie the Eagle now. That's wonderful. Let's <laughs> let's end it with that. That's glorious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, Mark. Pleasure, Alison.